music, lifestyle, and the most interesting people in the world. They all end up in Music City. I'm Devin O'Day, and this is my Nashville. Harry Thomason is a director, an author, a producer, a former football coach, and like many of us that grew up in the Deep South, the son of a Southern Baptist deacon. He met his wife, Linda Bloodworth Thomason, in Los Angeles, and they became partners in love and business. Southeast Arkansas has yielded presidents and politicians, actors, and award-winning writers. From Designing Women to Evening Shade to a documentary called The Man from Hope, there's a list of credits a mile long. But he was recently at a Nashville premier bookstore, Parnassus in Green Hills, to discuss his book, Just Simple Stories of His Youth, Brother Dog, Southern Tales, and Hollywood Adventures. At the end of our discussion, I'll tell you a few bookstores locally where you can find or order his book, Harry Thomason. One of the things I find fascinating, being from the South as well, being from a similar area in the South as you're from, how that little area created people like you created people like a president, like owners of major companies that rule the world. What was it about that area that gave you the stick to to be more than just saying, well, I can't go anywhere but here? You know, I, I think that it was because we had parents that didn't set limits. I mean, they let us... They believed we could do anything we wanted to do if we would work hard enough. And I think they taught us that work ethic. And I think uh, we all took care of each other, too. Most of those businesses that all these guys founded wouldn't have been founded without the help of other people from our region. And so it's that whole part of, of the country has, has, has always been that way. And I, I can just think, well... I feel like I'm the village idiot in my hometown because there's, in its population, 1,500 because there's so many more people that were more successful than I have been. I mean, you know, at founding bank chains and other filmmakers and uh, singers. And, uh, and so, and I think that was sort of inbred into all of us that we could do what we wanted to do. And I'm not sure today that that people are taught that, especially in other parts of the country. I think they don't have as much freedom to express ourselves and be ourselves as we all have, and we all had from that region of the country. Another regional thing is that people can be bent in a lot of different directions. By that, I mean you can be a football coach and also be a Renaissance man that studied art. Well, uh, that's right. I, I, I feel I was... Very lucky. I loved, I thought I would never be anything but a football coach because that's what I wanted to do. But I was always interested in art and, and you know, and still am and still paint and uh, and do things. And I enjoyed teaching art to kids, too. And and that was another thing. When I was at that school, in, in the second school in, in, in Little Rock, the principal one day called me in and he said, Harry, we want to try something. We want you to teach a class. And I said... Okay, but what am I teaching? He said, you're teaching anything you want to teach. And I said, really, you mean it? And he said, yes. And so we had a class, and I was able to do anything and talk about anything that I wanted to and the kids wanted to in class. And it it, it made the difference in those kids' lives. I'm convinced they learned a lot of things they would have never learned from textbooks or anything else but just the adventures we took as a class. Okay, I'm a sucker for a great love story. Tell me, you and your wife, how did you meet? Well, my wife, uh, Linda Bloodworth Thomas, and of course she's from uh, Popper Bluff, Missouri, but but her grandparents were from uh, Cotton Plant, Arkansas, and so uh, her grandfather was an attorney, was a newspaper publisher and an attorney, and he was shot by the Klan, so they just moved thirty miles across the line and. Uh, Missouri, where they felt safer, but and uh, her brothers all went to school in Arkansas at Arkansas State, and you know, and they were all famous attorneys. I mean, you know, her her uncle was the judge advocate at Newenburg, and her dad was uh, 
head of the Bar Association, and it was just and it was just a remarkable thing. And so when I first got a a job in Los Angeles at Columbia Pictures, which you'll read about, I was just in the office one day, and this uh, this um, woman sticks her head in the door and said, "I hear another hick accent like mine," and said, "Where are you from?" And you know, and so that's how we met, and and that's how we ultimately fell in love and and were with each other. And so it was the same thing. And she, even though everybody, well, she's from Missouri. She's, it's all a part of this. And that's why she has worked so hard all her life. And it's cost her, it's cost her in a lot of ways to fight for, look, we're going to promote the smart Southern culture. And it's just as smart as the culture anywhere else. We, the, you know, people have always picked the wrong things to focus on. And we're going to do the opposite of that. And so a lot of, uh, you know, I can tell you that a lot of people didn't like designing women because of that. <clears throat> we were trying to sell a reboot. I mean, people wanted to sell a reboot of the series. And they were, and so she came up with a show called, uh, uh, it was called Designing Women Now, I think, so, but it was different women, but playing basically the, the same characters and and everybody loved the script, and we took it to a network. Well, I'm not even going to be bashful, ABC. <laughs> and uh, they bought it because they're people underling it. They loved it, and they read it. And then Fox and ABC merged, and they brought over a new person to take over as president. And she was she didn't know how to get to Dallas, for one thing. And, uh, and she said, well, I've never seen any designing. I just don't think we ought to do this. And, and it's funny, uh, a major casting director in Los Angeles uh, called me last week and called Linda and she said, hey, it's funny, I want to tell you I was out, uh, I was out, I had to go to lunch with the head of ABC Casting last week. And she said, Libby, some months ago I read the funniest, best script I've ever read. And Libby, who knew about the script, said, Linda Bloodworth knew Designing Women, right? And she said, right. And we didn't do it. And people over here are very unhappy. So It was appointment watching. It was just appointment watching, and it gave me pride about being from the South. When I moved to New York from the South, I just thought, but designing women, that's who we are. you know. And when you started pitching, now you've had a lot of success now. Obviously, pitching is still, it takes a lot, and there's always somebody new that you have to pitch to. But when you first started pitching, what was the most discouraging thing that you ever came up against, and how did you mentally fight it? I think that it, it, it's always been, well, nobody wants to see a show based on Southerners unless it's really funny like Beverly Hillbillies or, or something like that. And, that's, and Linda always does smart shows. And, uh, and, that's, and we caught a break even on Evening Shade, except Burt Reynolds turned out to be a handful, bless his heart. And I still love the guy anyway, but uh, we tried to make uh, make that a smart show but even they would talk bird and oh well let's make it broader and funnier no broad and broad is not necessarily funny broad might make the guy that's doing the laugh track put bigger laughs on but that doesn't mean it's funnier and so we we just like to keep things linda does real totally realistic not over broad and do subject matter about things you know a lot of the designing women uh, episodes we did couldn't be on the air today because people are so politically conscious now, all the networks, I mean the networks, not necessarily the cable outlet, but they are really afraid to do anything that's going to have any originality. You know, and uh, somehow along the way, all network characters involved in the, uh, evolved into talking in sing-songy voices. You know, the same rhythm. And it really kills the show because that's not the way life is and people don't talk in little rhymes. And little, and, and so that was always discouraging that to write a realistic show about the South, it was always an uphill battle. Favorite character still to this day is Delta Burke's character, Suzanne, when she, I mean, her pageant things. And pageant life in the South, it was, I was a pageant girl. Right. So it captured everything, and it was so joyful. And I do have, still have my crown. Well, good for you. 
because one of the, even though I was playing football in college, one of the first things that I did that had, I, and, and I was the assist, I wasn't in command, they brought a guy from, but was the Miss Magnolia pageant. And, you know, and, and after that, I mean, I did other pageants and we'd always have, usually we would have the Kilgore Ranger Edge with us, some of them to perform too. So, yes, but people have never understood how, what pageants meant in the South and, you know, friend of mine, Donna Axum, was named Miss America. I mean, you know, and she's a very close friend of my brother's and friend of mine, too. So we understood the pageant life. To start writing books, to make the transition from the the script, which has tight writing and, and working with that kind of a feel, moving into books, was there any difficult thing? Because I, I t- some people, when they move to long form, um, it's like, oh, my gosh, this is longer than what I planned. It's all difficult for me because I don't consider myself a writer. I mean, I consider my the, my wife is the writer, and I wouldn't dare touch anything she does. So when I but the book is short, and it's because of just what you said. <laughs> like, uh, this seems overwhelming, you know. I've got to, and my every day my wife would did you tell the story of this, and I would say no, and she said shame on you. Now you've got to write another book, and so, and I plan on doing it, and I think I'll adjust better. Uh, this time, but writing, people don't understand how hard writing long form books and so forth is. It just, it takes a long time and you, and you can't just do it once. You've got to read through it and recorrect it and so forth. And that's what's good. My book is just a book of stories. And so it's much easier to write and not have to think of the plot that runs all the way through it. It's just, it's just life about life. Well, it's glorious, and we appreciate your time tonight, brother, dog, and uh, it's wherever books are sold, so wherever you're listening to this, you can find it, and if you're in Nashville, go to Parnassus, because it is the bookstore of bookstores. This is a great bookstore, and I've heard about it all my life, and Melinda just read the latest book of the co-owner of of the bookstore and, and really loved it, and also... We loved your sister, too. I mean, we never got a chance to work with her, but we were always looking after Murphy Brown was over. And, and Diane England was a friend, English was a friend of ours, too. And we were always looking for something to get your sister involved in. So we love your sister. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Well, you know, when that new Designing Women comes around, there's always good because she looks awesome. <laughs> she said, she goes, I just think it's okay if women don't go get their faces all fixed. People say I look good. And I go, this is what natural aging looks like in the South. Well, she does look great. She does. <laughs> That's the last thing I saw with her, she looked great. So, Thank you, Harry. Thank you so much. And you're very kind to let me do this. Thank you. Some wonderful places to find or order Harry Thomason's book, Brother Dog, Southern Tales and Hollywood Adventures, Harper's Books, just off the lovely square in Lebanon, Tennessee. The Grumpy Book Peddler used books in Murfreesboro. Parnassus in Green Hills. The Bookshop in East Nashville. Reading Rock Books in Dixon. And of course, Barnes & Noble, Books a Million, and anywhere you like to buy books. This podcast is available for streaming only, and all music is used by permission for promotional purposes. You can purchase any of the music used at the live performances for each of the artists or download or purchase wherever you find great music. Remember, if you love the music made by an artist, support them by buying a ticket, a CD, an album, or a T-shirt. Because when you support the music you love and the musician that makes that music, they can continue to do so. Devon O'Day's Nashville is brought to you in part by some incredible underwriters. You can join our community at DevonO'Day'sNashville.com on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Stories and links to even more about our city can be found under the Stories and Links page on the website. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to share. I'm Devon O'Day, and this is my Nashville.